Well, welcome to Tuesday. Here we go. Um, <laughs> after Children of the Sun Billy Thorpe yesterday, I thought, what kind of an extreme could I go to today to uh, to move things along? And uh, I was dinking around last night looking at, at songs and came across one of the coolest guys I've really had the pleasure of working with, and that's Marty Stewart. Um, I did uh, this album with him, I think it was 89 when we recorded this. Uh, it's called Hillbilly Rock, and Marty is just one of those those guys. I, I wrote down a whole bunch of notes here because I want to get everybody correct here. Um, on this project, um, Tony Brown produced it. I'd worked a lot with Tony on many, many, many albums, and um, he was part of Emmy Lou Harris's hot band. He's Tony's a really fine keyboard player. And he uh, became a producer down in Nashville, and he's one of the major contenders, uh, been for decades now in Nashville. He's really great. Um, and we recorded this at Soundstage Studios, where I did uh, all uh, so much of the work with Jimmy Bowen uh, over the years. Um, so we have Marty Stewart is, is vocals. He's playing lead guitar, rhythm guitar, and mandolin on this. Billy Thomas is playing drums, myself on bass. Glenn D. Harden is the piano player on this. Ralph Mooney is on steel guitar. Um, and Marty has an amazing history. I mean, he got started really, really young. And uh, he uh, worked with Lester Flatt of Flatt and Scruggs. He worked with Vassar Clements. He worked with Doc Watson. He was in Johnny Cash's band. And this is all when he was really, really young. He was kind of one of those guys that just sort of popped out with a lot of talent. And the thing I love about Marty so much is he would show up uh, at the studio like 10 a.m. bright and early um, to hit, hit a downbeat. And he'd walk in looking like he was coming to a photo shoot. I mean, he's got this big head of hair and it was all sprayed perfect. And he had on his his coats with rhinestones and, and all this stuff and his great boots and everything. I mean, everybody looked like a bunch of bums in the studio. And here's this guy coming in, just, man, just as good as it gets, as good as it gets, man, a, a beautiful cat, a great, great player, um, and just a fun guy to, to be around. Um, thing that, that I find interesting now, too, is he's, he's had different incarnations in his band over the years, and in the, the, the most current lineup, he has Christopher Scruggs playing bass and some steel with him. Well, when I produced... Uh, along with Gail Davies, Gail Davies' album, and Gail was one of the finest female vocalists um, in country, period, a great, great songwriter. Um, Chris is the, the baby she had when we were in the studio, and he's become a real major player in Nashville, too, as, as, since he uh, became an adult. Uh, he's, he plays everything, and he's just really talented, and he looks totally retro. I mean, he's like got the kind of 50s thing down, like just to a T. And uh, it's a great bunch of people. I'm, I'm going to probably hang out in Nashville for for a, a, a maybe the rest of the week because um, there's so many people from there that I've worked with. I've done several hundred albums in Nashville with a lot of artists, in, in especially in the early days of, of their careers. And uh, it's really fun to visit them. I have a lot of memories. And whenever I'd go to Nashville, one of the things I discovered in Nashville uh, was called the Goo Goo Cluster. <laughs> it's a, it was the first combination candy bar ever made. Before a Goo Goo, Goo Cluster, everything candy bar was chocolate. Um, Goo Goos came along and they were uh, marshmallow chocolate, peanuts. Um, it was all uh, caramel. It was all mixed together and, and made by the Standard Candy Company of Nashville. And I remember one of the first times I went to Nashville, going out to the factory, their original old factory. And uh, they said, come on in. And I walked in and they showed me how they made them. And uh, they gave me a, a box of seconds. And every time we would go through town uh, on tour, we'd play there like with James or whoever, 
I'd whip out there to the, and the, the factory moved to a, a, off on Massman Road. I remember that. And I would go out there and I'd pick up a couple of boxes of seconds because they didn't have to wrap them. So you'd get a ton of them in a box. Just It's hard to imagine that they were irregularly shaped because they were such an irregular shape to start with. I don't know where that judgment call came from. But um, I would grab that and put it on the bus. And man, there would be like peanut debris all over the carpeting in the bus and stuff. But everybody was like... May as well have been heroin the way the people were jumping all over these goo goos. And they've been the sponsor of the Grand Old Opry um, forever. And it's, I don't know whether there's a, a coincidence in the fact that G O O is also Grand Old Opry, but goo goo clusters. Um, so, I mean, I, there's so many things about Nashville that I, that I always loved. There was um, a place called The Great Escape that was an old magazine comic book store. And I went in there one of the times I was there and somebody had just dumped off a box of every issue of Hot Rod magazine dating back to the late 50s. And I think 57 might have been like the earliest one in this box. And there was hundreds of these in there. And I just walked in and I looked at it and I said, how much? And the guy just went, oh, give me, give me 50 bucks. Man, I've got a, a filing cabinet out in my garage with all of those. And I'm, I look through, especially the ones from the 60s. And all of a sudden, I'm back in, in junior high and high school um, from late 50s up, you know, looking because that's I lived for Hot Rod Magazine and Hot Rods and all the, that whole scene. Southern California was ripe with, with hot rodding. So, um, you know, and plus... Great, greasy, good food there. You know, you go to the Loveless Cafe and eat fried chicken, go to Hap Towns and have fried chicken. And Hap would come over this real tall, skinny, lanky man, and he'd lean over your shoulder and go, would you like some more gravy on them taters? <laughs> it was like, it was great. And so many great players down there. So I love it. But Marty, man, there's nobody like Marty. If you want, go... Go dig up some videos of Marty, man. He is he is a trip. He is he's one of the really good guys, but his image is so ingrained and, and it's just so cool. So this is a song we did. This was the title song from that album, and I think it was a it ended up doing really, really well. I think it was at least a top ten record. So it's called Hillbilly Rock. So here we go. Oh, hold on. Just a just a minute. Oh, stop it, you schmuck. You, I am such an idiot sometimes. Jesus Christ. You know, I was testing the sound and then I forgot to put it back to the top of the uh, video. So, here we go. Really simple.
you know, the antithesis of Children of the Sun, Billy Thorpe, <laughs> you know, just going the opposite direction. But there's just something really nice of just... You know, there's... Everybody always used to say to me, isn't it boring going and playing country? And I would say, not in the least, because it's music, it's fun. You know, I love... I always loved working on country music. The thing is, if you really want to be successful in the um, stu the world of studio musician, you don't be judgmental of different styles. You embrace all of the styles and you try to absorb them, be it country, reggae, funk, jazz, R&B, pop, metal, anything. It's all music. And you just go out there and you try to do the best you can with what you're dealt. And the players, every time you do one of these things, it's a different batch of players. And you get so you learn something new every time you're with somebody new. And that's one of the beautiful things about studio work is I've gotten to be with the best players in the world. And man, uh, every day is an education. There's something to be learned every single day in this business. Um, so I just wanted to uh, jump into another world in here. So I'm, I'm looking at a whole bunch of people, um, Susie Bogus and Patty Loveless. So we've got Reba, got Vince Gill, um, all kinds of, you know, Clint Black. Um, we've done records with all, all these, the, this cast of characters. And uh, so I'm gonna visit a whole bunch of that stuff, I think. Uh, it really brings back fond memories to me and a lot of pleasure. So I'm going to wish everybody a great Tuesday. I, I just finished uh, a podcast this morning, just before this, and then I've got another one coming in at, at five o'clock tonight. I mean, this, we have such a great team working for the immediate family um, that we are just loaded with all kinds of things. We're doing a thing for the Grammy Museum, um, doing a virtual panel for the NAM show with Mr. Bonsai. Um, just all kinds of stuff. We're doing all our interviews for the movie that's being made about us. And uh, I can't imagine how busy we'd be if there wasn't a lockdown, because we're doing everything we can in virtual world. We're getting ready with the, uh, the great Rob Shanahan, who's one of the greatest photographers um, in rock and roll. I'm really proud that he included me in, in his first big book, coffee table book. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful book. You got to check it out. It's it Rob's really something, and we're getting ready to go and do a photo shoot with him. And uh, since I only wear black t-shirts, it seems, or dark blue t-shirts all the time, they want different shots. So I'm going to bring a bunch of different bases, so I look different in different shots. Um, it's the price of, of of glamour, I guess, or something like that. And again, man, I am hearing from people every day who are now sick and, you know, thought they were in a completely safe world and, uh, and doing the right thing. And they've got the virus now. So please, please, I mean, I implore you, be smart. You see all these people out there acting like this is a, these guys, it's a test of their manhood, whether or not they're going to wear a mask or not. Well, see how your manhood does when the worms are eating you and you're six feet under uh, because people are dying every day and the numbers are going up. Where every, Everywhere else in the world, the numbers are declining, but because of the way things are going here, our numbers are soaring. So don't be a statistic, please. And really thank you so much to everybody, the doctors, the nurses. I was just in the grocery store this morning and all the people there are working there in their masks behind plexiglass, got gloves and everything. They're doing their damnedest to make sure that everybody gets what they need and is okay. Um, I've seen guys out working here, construction guys in the neighborhood. And uh, man, I, my heart goes out to all these people who are trying so hard and uh, just do the right thing. Even if in your mind you don't think it's the right thing, it'll make everybody around you far more comfortable. And that's really the important thing. This is a this is not an attack on your individual rights or liberties. This is a, a, a global community issue. And, it, and this disease doesn't pick sides. It's not liberal or conservative or Republican or Democrat or Christian or Muslim or atheist or anything. It's a disease. 
and it's hungry and we as i said earlier we are the blue plate special so please be careful out there and i will see you guys tomorrow with uh, some more country so take care i'll remember to put the thing back to the top when i start